Hyrox is just a CrossFit workout. That's what a lot of CrossFit purists have commented on our latest video about Tia trying to compete in both sports. And sure, on the surface, they're right. I mean, Hyrox took a couple of classic CrossFit movements and turned that into a longer workout, which they called fitness racing. But that is besides the point, because to truly excel in Hyrox, especially at the elite level, athletes need to fundamentally change their training, even though the movements look familiar. And in this video, I will explain three reasons why, coming from a biomechanics point of view, a physiology standpoint, and also talking about nutrition. And certainly that last part, the science of carbohydrate intake during a Hyrox race versus a CrossFit competition or a CrossFit workout is especially interesting because just recently, some interesting data has been published. All right, without further ado, let's go straight into it. Hi everyone, I'm Gomar. I'm a senior scientist at ETH Zurich, based in Switzerland. And for the last decade or so, I studied and taught different aspects of exercise physiology and now want to bring some of that science back to you guys. So one of the things I think that Hyrox really did well, what they actually nailed, and that's also why they are so popular in my opinion, is they took the right movements from CrossFit. And those right movements or those specific movements are very horizontal in nature. The goal is to cover distance. Think about it, what, what, they, what they took. Lunges, burpee broad jumps, rowing, carries, and obviously also the running portion of the whole Hyrox race. And why is it so interesting and why is it so important? Because it's fundamentally different to what usually is programmed in CrossFit, because CrossFit is much more vertical in nature. You always have to fight upwards against gravity, right? Pull-ups, deadlifts, squats, normal burpees, box jumps, and so on. It's all about vertical movement. And this has a fundamental implication on the biomechanics of the sport. Just look at gait and locomotion. Hyrox athletes need to master smooth, repeatable movement patterns, and especially the running. The running technique is super important. For example, stride efficiency, ground contact force, and even the foot strike matters a lot. While in CrossFit, this is much less the case. Okay, there is sometimes a running program, but it's much less prominent in the sport, for sure, of CrossFit. And this translates well into posture and muscle activation. In Hyrox, there's much more demand and just emphasis on maintaining this forward-leaning, efficient posture for longer cyclical periods. While think about how your core, your hamstring, your, your, your glutes are used during a sled pull and a sled push versus a power clean, right? This immediately shows that CrossFit is much more explosive using triple extension all the time, ankles, knees, and hips, while high rocks Specifically, the running and, and most of the, the functional movements are much more cyclical, uh, lighter in nature and affecting much more the aerobic system. We'll get to that in a second. So that's all nice biomechanics, but this also fundamentally changes how athletes should train. Certainly when they are coming from a more CrossFit background, a high power output background, this does affect their training principles, right? Because they not only have to run more, they have to be able to, to, to run just more miles and to get that aerobic engine better, but they also have to run more efficiently. The goal for them is to run as fast as possible, to generate as much speed as possible using the least amount of oxygen. And that's exactly the definition of movement efficiency. And how did they do that? Is not only by just running a lot of zone two and doing some tempo runs, but actually also doing a lot of running drills, specific running drills. For example, how we program this in our Hyrox engine builder, specifically for athletes coming from more from a CrossFit background and want to improve their running, their whole mechanics of running. Let's go, for instance, to our uh, programming and let's go to a tempo run, right? Like a tempo run, a sub-threshold pace uh, interval run, right? So you could do that only, all right? But in our warm-up, we specifically program like 30 meters of uh, running high knees, 30 meters of uh, normal A skips, power skips, and also uh, side skips. Uh, and this is really to improve this overall running efficiency, right? To minimizing the ground contact forces. So this means that although Hyrox and CrossFit are utilizing exactly the same movements, people who want to excel in Hyrox need to tune down on this max effort 
barbell cycling or barbell lifting. Their training needs to be much more specified and focused on longer submaximal or sub-threshold pace uh, efforts. And that's interesting because you actually start seeing this already in the physiology of high-profile athletes. What I did here is I tested an elite 15 Hyrox racer, as well as a multiple CrossFit Games athlete. And what did I do? I did a step test to exhaustion, where on the runner or on the bike, the athlete always increased in intensity every three minutes until they could not run or bike anymore. So the intensity was too high that they couldn't hold the pace anymore, right? And you see immediately a vast difference between the two athletes. The Elite 15 Hyrox Racer, you can see it immediately, has a very long aerobic base, which means that the lactate, which is indicated here in orange, stays low for a very long time. Look at this, up until 15 or 14 and a half kilometers an hour, that's fast running, his lactate stays at 1.5 to 2.0, meaning that the energy that is converted towards his mechanical motion, his actual running, is coming predominantly from aerobic energy systems, right? And then he has a very short moment that his lactate goes up, so anaerobic production goes up, and then he completely blows up a couple intervals later. While the CrossFit athlete, you can see it immediately just visualizing it, even not analyzing the data, has a much less developed aerobic base. His lactate stays low for a couple of intervals, but then shoots up quite significantly first linearly and then exponentially. And, and this translates really well into a small middle zone for the Hyrox athlete. What do I mean with a middle zone? It's basically a blend between aerobic and anaerobic uh, energy systems where the lactate goes up kind of linearly but doesn't exponentially go up. So it's, it, it's sub-threshold pace. And then pretty nicely for the CrossFit athlete, this zone, this middle zone, it's much wider because you can also look at it from the other side. The CrossFit athlete has a much better, a way higher developed anaerobic system. He has to produce a lot of power above threshold. And this is very well visualized in uh, such a test you can see here. So the comments, or at least the thinking process of some people coming more from the, the CrossFit background, CrossFit purists. For example, here, what he says is the only difference to training for high rocks versus training for CrossFit is only one thing, a little bit more running. Outside of that, CrossFit translate really well to most parts of high rocks, and all you need is a few specialization sessions a week and to bridge that gap into the sports. Well, for 95% of the athletes or people who want to transition towards high rocks, it's probably true. If you don't want to, whatever, beat 60 minutes in a high rocks in a pro race, that's probably true. But if you want to excel at the highest level, you definitely have to incorporate much more running, like fundamentally more running. I've been talking to Hyrox Elite 15 racers and they run more than 100 kilometers per week, right? If a CrossFit athlete does 100 kilometers of running per week, he will be so crushed that he cannot do any other type of training anymore and obviously his whole training scheme will be in shambles. So I really don't think that this comment is valid, even for potentially for some lower level athletes who just want to have fun. But if you want to take high rocks as a sport serious, I do think you have to kind of shift your training away from CrossFit and really think about how should I train for high rocks because they are fundamentally different in this case. And we really want to, let's say, apply this differentiation in our programming because I think it's actually quite important. Just look at, for example, this week of our high rocks engine programming. On Monday, we have a zone two run for the Hyroxes, right? Like that's typical, a 45 minute zone two run. And then on Tuesday, so the next day, we have something completely different. So a typical hybrid style training where we do pure lifting, only lifting, right? So Monday running and then lifting. And then on Wednesday, we have, I call this a functional threshold day where we do threshold training, but using functional movements, specifically the stations of Hyrox. And then on Thursday, it's gonna be a tempo run, including some of the running drills, I think it's super important to include this actually uh, in the warm-up. Friday will be the only rest day of the week. Saturday will be a high specific day where we do this typical Instagram style workouts where you do some kind of long, high volume, uh, movement specific uh, workout, always at or even above thresholds because it's also fun to do and many people like to do it. And then on uh, Sunday, we do have again a longer zone two run or a conditioning session on the ergs, okay? So 
Obviously, that is fundamentally different compared to our uh, CrossFit style uh, training. This is the functional season. That's our, let's say, more most basic style of uh, CrossFit programming, where we on Monday would have a rest day, right? And then on Tuesday, we have weightlifting into uh, a squat, uh, only strength, right? So no workout or whatever, just only uh, weightlifting. And then on Wednesday, we have bench, so upper body strength into a high intensity uh, workout. On Thursday, we have a rest day. On Friday, we have our more lower intensity, I'm not really calling this zone two, but rather low intensity uh, workout using functional movements. And then on Saturday, we have again this kind of hybrid style training where we do only clean and jerks and squats, so only strength and weightlifting. And then on Sunday, we have, let's say, gymnastic strength into a metcon, so basically interference training. So not that much running at all. And if you think about it as, or from a more holistic perspective, really different styles of training. And then lastly, a topic that I haven't been talking a lot about recently, and that's gonna be nutrition, because nutrition is interesting for Hyrox, in my opinion, because there is a lot of good research on nutrition, sports nutrition, for more endurance type sports, longer than 45 minutes, 60 minutes. We have now very good data showing that if you implement carbohydrates during such a race, during such a high intensity, even uh, endurance style uh, race, that it could be beneficial for performance. But is this also true for CrossFit? Let's dive in. So here, for example, you see a beautiful study from 2001 that looked at gastric emptying. And gastric emptying is just emptying of the stomach uh, from fluid. And that's super important for an athlete of, of all calibers uh, that the gastric emptying works fast and efficient so that there's no gastrointestinal stress or pain in the stomach during a race, for example, right? And what you see here is that the intensity of your exercise is actually a determining factor for how fast your gastric emptying works. For example, here in this study, they looked at four different groups, right? One group did nothing, they were just resting. Another group was training continuously biking for 60 minutes at 66% of their view to max, so kind of moderate to easy intensity. Uh, and then two other groups, one also trained at 66% of their VO2, but more intermittent, so going at it and then resting, going at it and then resting. And then the last group, the, the most interesting group, trained at more or higher intensity, at 75% of their VO2 max. So that would be close to the threshold, something that is quite annoyingly hard. And what did they do? They ingested 600 milliliters of a fluid, a 6% carbohydrate containing fluid, and they just checked how fast this fluid over this hour of, of exercise went out of the stomach, was the emptying of the stomach. And you see very nicely that the higher the intensity and also the more intermittent the intensity is, or the exercise is, that the gastric emptying goes slower. So that's very specifically important for Hyrox because Hyrox has, is done at very high intensities, 75, 80, even 90% of VO2 max for a very long time. So you could consider or think about the fact that the gastric emptying will be pretty slow in those races, certainly when the athlete is not trained. And there we come to the interesting concept, I think, coined by a famous sports nutritionist called Asker Jeukendrup, and he talked about training the gut. And it has now been well established that a lot of endurance type athletes do a lot of gut training, meaning that they consume high amounts of carbohydrates during a simulation or during some kind of race to really teach the body to absorb all those nutrients, specifically carbohydrates. And this has to do with several factors, but one interesting one is that if you consume repetitively high carbohydrates, diets or, or, or fluids during exercise, then you can train a specific, let's say, nutrient transporter called sodium-dependent glucose transporter 1, and that is upregulated in the gut, meaning that the, the athlete or the person or the, the participant can transport more glucose through the gut wall into the bloodstream. Obviously, this will be beneficial for actual carbohydrate oxidation, right? So pretty interesting concept, training the gut. That is very important for specifically Hyrox athletes given their long, high-intensity duration. But you can think, okay, that's nice, but I mean, also CrossFit athletes need to do this, right? I'm not so sure. I mean, just very recently, I was, I was checking some CrossFit-related research and a study came out, I think a couple of weeks ago, that looked at what happens if you provide carbohydrates, 60 grams of carbohydrates 
during a CrossFit workout? Will the overall, let's say, performance of the participants in that CrossFit workout be improved, right? Because, I mean, you provide carbohydrates and that's probably, probably uh, useful uh, in that case. Not so fast. They did a two-hour long workout consisting of weightlifting, squatting, an EMOM and an AMRAP. So really like an exhausting longer workout. And they gave, as I said, 60 grams of carbohydrates. And then they checked several, let's say, feeling parameters, but also performance parameters. And the results were, were very interesting in my opinion. They actually found nothing. For example, the repetitions they could do in the placebo trial versus the carbohydrate trial was the same. The rate of perceived exertion, so how hard it felt, the same between the conditions. And then also the amount of thrusters in the EMOM they could do. They did, did an EMOM of 20 seconds rest and then 40 seconds all out empty bar thrusters uh, was the same. So it seems that because of the more anaerobic nature, power nature of the sport and the fact that there's whatever you program, there's always going to be a lot of rest in one hour of two hour of CrossFit training there is sufficient amount of glycogen stores in the muscles to deliver enough energy for the muscles. And adding exogenous carbohydrates, so carbohydrates that you actually eat or drink, doesn't seem to really benefit a CrossFit athlete, at least acutely. So training the gut for an average class goer or an average Joe in CrossFit is likely not the most important thing to do. While even at lower levels, I think for high rocks, certainly when you're, you're working longer than an hour, one hour, 20, one hour, 30, even in a high rocks race, it is going to be very important to actually teach the body to use the carbohydrates that you can use in race. I will link all the papers or at least the references to the papers I just showed in the link in description. Then you can download them and have a look at them again. So this brings us to the take home messages and what you can take home for your own training. I think high rocks and CrossFit obviously are, are very similar, meaning that they do use the same or similar movements, but High Rock specifically picked, let's say, the right movements that they picked movements that are horizontal in nature, right? Like you have to cover distance with High Rocks while CrossFit, everything or 95% of the movements are more vertical in nature, trying to fight against gravity. And this has strong repercussions on how the biomechanics are of both sports and let's say how these biomechanical differences changes the physiology of a Hyrox, a typical Hyrox athlete versus a CrossFit athlete, and hence how you also should train for both modalities. And interestingly, this seems to even impact nutrition because of the fact that Hyrox is such a, a long, more endurance type sports, uh, training your gut and being able to accept a lot of carbohydrates, not only during competition, but also during training, during high volume training, is gonna be very important for an elite Hyrox racer, but also for someone who just trains casually for Hyrox. While in CrossFit, it's much more intermittent. You have a lot of time to eat in between workouts, after workouts, before workouts. So this nutrition part, at least during the workout, is going to be much less of an issue. Good, that was it from my part today. If you found some value in this video, please don't forget to like and also subscribe to the channel. I was just checking my analytics and 70% of all the people who watch my videos are actually not subscribed. I found this pretty high. So don't forget to subscribe. If you haven't watched the video yet where I explain my reasoning and my thinking behind the fact that it will be very difficult or at least very challenging for Tia Claire Toomey to compete both in High Rocks as well as winning the CrossFit Games, just click the video that is popping up right now. See you in the next one. Ciao.